Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about Carl Rogers, and uh, you do have a number of uh, supplemental videos this week. Let me know if they work or not. If not, like I said, don't go crazy. Um, the main one is Carl Rogers, the Gloria Tapes, person-centered theory. You can probably find that on YouTube if you can't get it in in uh, the D2L link, but it works now, so hopefully it'll work with you as well. Um, when I don't have a multimodal class, I usually watch that together in class, uh, but instead you can watch it on your own and you can respond in the discussion post. All right, so the thing that I like best about this lecture is Carl Rogers is one of my favorite theorists. And um, Carl Rogers often reminds me a lot of Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers. Uh, and um, so, uh, I used to sit across the aisle from Mr. Rogers in church, and uh, he was a pretty nice guy, um, but uh, didn't wear his sweaters to church, just wore a sport coat. But um, when uh, I tried to do a little research on this, um, and... Uh, I always thought that when I was watching Mr. Rogers television shows for kids, I always thought he really used person-centered theory from Carl Rogers. Um, I don't think their paths crossed. I know that Mr. Rogers attended uh, Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, um, and I'm sure uh, at some point, uh, he looked at this theory, but he never really made mention of it. He made mention of a few theologians and philosophers, um, but uh, but you'll see what I mean uh, after you watch some of his videos, especially the Gloria tapes. And as we go through this theory, some of you may have already taken skills, but most of you are either taking it now or have not yet taken it. So skills and techniques of counseling. That course is primarily based on person-centered theory. When <clears throat> Dr. Samid, Jeff Samid and I designed that course, we wanted to provide a foundational uh, education for all counseling students that we're going to begin practicum in a semester or two. So we knew that one of the most important aspects of counseling is to build a trusting relationship with the client, to be present for the client, and to be able to use basic skills that this theory talks about. Um, reflection, paraphrase, summarization, clarification, pointing out incongruencies. Uh, those are the five primary skills and techniques that Carl Roger uses. We think that this theory can stand on its own as an independent theory However, if you like other theories, most counselors begin with person-centered and then they'll uh, incorporate other theories with it. Um, so even in most counseling sessions, uh, it becomes a foundational theory to build trust, to... Uh, you know, be present for the client, to get good narratives and to understand a deeper feeling, 
to keep things at a feeling level rather than a more surface oriented cognitive level. And uh, once you find that deeper emotion, um, then you can identify a theme and an issue for the client that you're going to work with uh, throughout the sessions. So if you learn this theory, you'll do very well in the skills class. So let's talk a little bit about Carl Rogers, uh, born 1902, died 1987. He had a warm family background. Um, they were fairly religious and strict. Play was discouraged, work was encouraged. You might call that the Protestant work ethic. Um, so he was often feeling lonely as a child. Uh, he didn't socialize very much, studied a great deal. He wasn't sure what his niche was in, in a career while he was in college. He moved around to a lot of different majors and uh, he started in agriculture, then he moved to history. He went to Union Theological Seminary and uh, we know that, um, you know, there were some existentialists there and uh, to study religion. And that is connected with Columbia Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City. So he's in the New York City uh, area, which uh, remember, the psychological school of thought moved from Vienna and Europe to New York and Boston. So he was in the midst of that at that point, and uh, he moved from Union Theological Seminary um, to uh, Columbia to study psychology, and that's what he ended up with. Uh, he found his niche and his calling. Um, 1964, he joined the staff of Western Behavioral Science Institute in La Jolla, California. And so now we're seeing the movement from the East Coast of the United States to the West Coast of the United States. So all of the uh, California state universities were really picking up on new psychological methods. And um, I believe Erickson worked there for a while with my professor at Berkeley. Uh, I studied with Donald Capps and uh, he worked with Erickson um, at Berkeley. And uh, so basically most of the schools in uh, the state schools in California uh, were really thriving in the area of psychology. So he worked in La Jolla 19, four years later, 1968. Um, he opened the Center for the Studies of the Person in La Jolla. He pioneered the humanistic movement. There are a couple different humanistic movements, and uh, this is the psychology humanistic movement in psychotherapy. And uh, it just means that he wanted to be human oriented, person centered. And uh, so his theory became known as the person centered approach. Later died of heart failure shortly after hip surgery resulting from a fall. Now, one thing I like about the way he worked on a theory is that, um, he was not afraid to change his theory. He wasn't so attached to one aspect of his theory. He always thought it could get better. And he was willing to take feedback. He was open for suggestions. He was always looking to be a better therapist, a better human being, and to make his theory better. Um, you can tell by the way he changed the name of his theory. So 
in the 40s, um, he started using non-directive counseling. And uh, he rebelled against the medical model and uh, did not believe in giving people advice or interpreting things for them. And uh, I think this concept of non-directive therapy was one of the biggest influences in my life. Um, so when I started out, after I graduated with my master's degree and opened up a private practice, one of my specialties was play therapy. And play therapy is about the most non-directive therapy that you can get. Uh, so, um, you know, if the child was playing in the sandbox, I never asked, what are you doing, you know? I simply reflected either what the child did or what the child said. I noticed that uh, you brought the army soldiers into the sandbox. And sometimes they would respond and sometimes they would keep playing, but that was up to them. And, uh, oh, I noticed that one of your soldiers is laying down in the sand. Yeah, he got hurt pretty bad. Oh, your soldier got hurt. Yeah, he got he got shot. And uh, so you're the soldier that's laying in the sand got shot. And, uh, you know, uh, eventually the child would say that his father was just deployed uh, overseas to the desert where there was a lot of conflict and he was worried about his father getting hurt. Um, so the reason that affected me in my, as a therapist and as a human being so much is that as I was starting uh, as a therapist, um, one of the things I was always worried I didn't want to harm a client in any way, either by saying the wrong thing or not saying what I should say. Um, and the second thing I worried about was running out of things to say if a client wasn't talkative and forthcoming. Uh, well, we've got a half hour left. What do I say next? So those were the two things I worried about starting out. And so I would really prepare for sessions. And uh, the um, I had memorized all the theories. I had read all the primary books on the theories. Um, and I would make a plan for that session. And we always had something therapeutic to do. We never ran out of things to say, but I never thought that we were making a lot of breakthroughs. And when I started doing play therapy and really using what is based in person-centered therapy, in fact, so Carl Rogers' daughter, her name is Natalie Rogers, and she was one of the founders of expressive arts therapy. So not so much play therapy, but art therapy, dance therapy, music therapy, sculpting, um, all of the kind of things that would be considered alternative therapies um, or expressive arts therapy. She wrote a foundational book on expressive arts therapy, and uh, it's still published today. Um, and I used to teach a course called expressive arts therapy. But um, so when we were playing in the sandbox, the one thing I had to do was give up control. And uh, I had to simply be present for that child and reflect on what they were doing in the session. As I learned more about person-centered therapy and how 
Carl Rogers would give complete control to the client. At first, that was a little scary because I didn't know what the client was going to say or do, and I had to throw my plan out the window. But I noticed that me giving up control in a session allowed the client the freedom to explore whatever they needed. And because I knew the theories well enough, it didn't matter what they brought up because I had an ability to respond therapeutically in some way, no matter what they brought up. So knowing the theories gave me the skills so that I could give up control in my ther therapy sessions. And uh, that's when I started seeing some real awareness take place, some growth taking place, and uh, it made for a much better therapeutic environment, not just for the client, but for me as well. One of the things about therapy, being a therapist, is that if you're really present for a client, I see a little bit of myself in every single client. And that means I learn a little more about myself in every single client. And I grow a little bit and the client grows a little bit. And the one thing that I learned that vastly improved my own life outside of therapy is that not only did I have to give up control in therapy, but I had to give up control in my relationships, in my own creative process, uh, in a lot of areas of my life. And uh, that vastly improved all of my relationships. Um, they're much more healthy. I'm much more healthy. Um, one of the things I had to do was realize what was going on with me that I needed control. And the answer was, of course, a fear of failure and rejection. So if I could control a relationship, if I could control work, if I could control anything, then I wouldn't fail. And I wouldn't be rejected by those other people in my life. I didn't believe that I deserved unconditional love and positive regard just for who I was. Doesn't that sound like Fred Rogers as well? I like you just the way you are. And, uh, you know, so there is that convergence. So I had to learn not only to accept myself, but uh, to believe that everybody deserves unconditional love and positive regard uh, in their lives. The uh, second one, so as this, theory was evolving in the 1950s, he moved on from being non-directive and incorporated that, but he wanted the focus to be the client. He wanted the client uh, to really take initiative, and he wanted to have that phenomenological experience with the client which creates empathy, putting oneself in the client's shoes. Phenomenology, remember, is understanding the subject, subjective reality of another person. So it's, it's the basis of empathy. In the 1960s, he wrote a book called On Becoming a Person. It's kind, kind of his foundational book. And then in the 70s, he finally came up with the title, which we continue to use today, person-centered approach or person-centered theory. So there is a little difference between existentialists and what he would call himself a humanist or phenomenologist. Um, existentialists stress anxiety which results in choices and taking personal responsibility for those choices, even if the choice is not to choose. 
humanists stress our natural potential if fostered. So he used the example of an acorn. So an acorn is a seed. If you plant that seed and it doesn't get enough sunshine, if it's not in nourishing soil, if it doesn't get enough water or care, if it is attacked by bugs or blight, uh, it will never grow to reach its full potential. But he believed that every human being, if nurtured, could reach their full potential. So he wanted to provide the appropriate nourishment for others so that everybody can reach their full potential. So his outlook on humanity is really positive. Nobody's stuck in the past. Nobody, uh, you know, uh, has to blame anybody else for who they are. Everybody deserves to be accepted for who they are. Everybody has the potential for positive change and growth. And everybody can reach their full potential if they're just nourished and fostered emotionally. So phenomenologically, he wants to focus on the client's own perception of self and the world. And sometimes people will have some inner conflicts in their mind or emotionally. And you'll see when you watch the Gloria tapes that he will use a technique called pointing out incongruencies. And he'll say, well, a little bit ago, I heard you say this, and now you're saying this. And I don't really understand how these two things go together. Could you explain that to me? And it's really pointing out inner conflict in the person. So, a lot of times people go into therapy and the therapist will say, what's your presenting problem? What is the presenting problem? Well, he wouldn't say that. He wants to focus on the person rather than the issue. And uh, he wants to foster independence and integration and uh, he believed that people should move towards act self-actualization, away from masks and facades, and uh, that the client can take control and set their own goals because they really know what they need the most. So there's a lot of encouragement, just like with Adler. And... Uh, Rogers would encourage the client to be open to the therapeutic experience, to have a professional relationship with one another, to trust in themselves, to begin to evaluate themselves emotionally and, and internally, and to continue to grow as an individual. He uses a definition for incongruence or incongruence, uh, a discrepancy between one's perception, one's self-perception, and one's experience in reality, the difference between the ideal self and the real self. So let's talk about the ideal self and the real self. And um, so... The ideal self is who we think we should be. And the first thing I want to look at and talk about with a client when I'm talking about ideal self and real self is when we're looking at the ideal self, it's kind of our hopes for who we should be. But I want to examine if that person they want to be is healthy or not. So for instance, perhaps one of their goals is to be a millionaire. Well, that's nice, but it might come at the expense of other values 
and needs. So if it comes at the expense of love and belonging, that might not be healthy. Um, so we want to help the client to evaluate their ideal self so that their ideal self will be a healthy self. Then they need to evaluate who they are right now. And sometimes if people are wearing masks or not living authentically, uh, they might not even realize that they're doing that. And so we want them to examine who they really are right now. What is healthy and what is not healthy. And then we want to compare their real self with the ideal self. How far away is that current real self from the ideal self? The closer, the healthier. And so once they are aware of these two parts of themselves, we want to bring them closer together so that they might be congruent, so that their real self can become their ideal self. So these are not techniques, these three uh, things that a therapist needs to possess. They are therapeutic qualities that the therapist brings to the session but don't confuse them with techniques. So the first quality is congruence or genuineness. So the person who is the therapist needs to have examined themselves and gotten rid of their inauthenticity, gotten rid of their masks, so that the therapist can be their genuine selves, their authentic self with the client. The second thing is that we need to have as therapists, unconditional positive regard and acceptance for the client. I am going to accept that client as a human being as they are. That doesn't mean I have to accept some horrible things they may have done. Maybe they are court mandated and maybe they've done some criminal things that have hurt other people. Doesn't mean I have to accept what they've done. I simply have to accept them as a human being who has the potential to grow and change in a positive way. If a therapist doesn't believe that their client can grow, no growth will take place. We have to have faith that the client has that potential. And the last thing, the last quality uh, that he mentions that a therapist should have is accurate empathic understanding. No, we can't feel exactly like a client feels. We didn't experience what they experienced. However, we should be able uh, to have at least some empathy as we place ourselves in the client's shoes or begin to better understand the client's subjective reality and their take of life and the world and self. We don't want to be totally off base. Uh, Corey writes that there should be six conditions for positive change to take place, but you don't have to memorize these. They're just an expansion of those three qualities. So I also included a chapter that I wrote for a textbook um, with an old student of mine, Joe Allen Smith. And uh, this was written for a school counseling theories book or textbook, but it doesn't matter. Just whenever I say student, just 
put in the word client if you're in clinical mental health. It applies to everybody, not just school counselors. So it goes over all the different things I talked about in more detail, including the real self, and the ideal self. My addition to this theory is called the continuum of change. And I drew a table and included that. And it talks about the different stages of change in the person-centered therapeutic journey. The other thing it includes is some techniques. And for your exam, I just want to list the techniques that you can use in your exam. So active listening is there, but that just means being present and listening to the client. I don't want you to use that as a technique in your exam. We're going to assume that you do that. Uh, however, um, I listed about six in this article. I listed three in the notes. Um, so the first technique is, and the most important one is reflection of feeling. So when we talk about reflection, imagine a mirror and you're holding a mirror to the client and the client expresses a feeling in just one or two words, you're going to reflect the feeling. You're going to repeat the feeling to the client client says, uh, you know, I feel extremely sad and depressed uh, because uh, of my recent separation from my partner. Oh, uh, you recently separated from your partner and you're feeling depressed as a result. That's reflection. Um, after the reflection, I usually see if there is a deeper feeling that results in that emotion. Is there a deeper emotion that results in that sadness? Is there something beyond the separation that you are reacting to? I feel betrayed by my partner. I feel rejected, not accepted, unloved, perhaps unworthy, perhaps not good enough, perhaps not good enough for what? Not good enough to be loved and accepted for who I am. So that's reflection and the process of getting to a deeper emotion. Paraphrase is very similar to reflection. That's the second technique. But just as para is and phrase is a little longer, it's when you think of reflection as being about a sentence, paraphrase is doing the same thing, but it's about a paragraph long. So perhaps uh, the client shared a story with you and you can paraphrase, you can uh show the client that you heard the essence of the story that they shared with you. The third thing is clarification. Clarification is making sure you're on the right track. So uh, I just wanna make sure I understand what you shared with me. Am I on the right track here? You feel rejected because of your partner's betrayal. And they'll tell you whether you're right or wrong, but at least you're checking in to make sure you're following them. The fourth thing is summarization. The summarization is usually at the end of a session, but it could be sooner if they talk for a long time. So summarization is you know, longer than a paragraph. And it's usually at the end of either a long discussion or a session. So let's talk about all of the things that we've covered together this session. 
We've talked about a lot of things. Here's what I can take from it as your therapist. Can you share what was most important to you in this session? And the last thing is uh, pointing out incongruencies. And that's when either cognitively or emotionally, or perhaps both, you're pointing out things that don't seem to go together. So for instance, you say that you feel very lonely because you don't have a relationship. And then you say you're working 70 hours a week to get a promotion. Those two things don't seem to be compatible. So pointing out incongruencies. So those are the five techniques that you can use when you are counseling the person in your case study for your exam. Questions about those techniques? They're very straightforward. Try to keep them simple. Let's see. All right. Um, that is the basics of Carl Rogers. And, uh, it's about 10 till five. We're gonna take a 10 minute break, come back around five, and then we're gonna watch a video um, of a role play. All right, so take a break, come back around five.